Chapter Five of A Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Pigeon Hunt. The new year dawned on Las Palomas, rich in promise of future content. Uncle Lance and I had had a long talk the evening before, and under the reasoning of the old optimist, the gloom gradually lifted from my spirits. I was glad I had been so brutally blunt that evening regarding what Mrs. McLeod had said about him, for it had a tendency to increase the rancher's aggressiveness on my behalf. Hell, Tom, said the old man, as we walked from the corrals to the house, don't let a little thing like this disturb you. Of course, she'll four-flush and bluff you if she can, but you don't want to pay any more attention to the old lady than if she were some pelado. To be sure, it would be better to have her consent, but then... Glenn Gallup also arrived at the ranch on New Year's Eve. He brought the report that wild pigeons were again roosting at the big bend of the river. It was a well-known pigeon roost, but the birds went to other winter feeding grounds, except during the years when there was plentiful sweet mast. This bend was about midway between the ranch and shepherds, and contained about two thousand acres, and was heavily timbered with ash, pecan, and hackberry. The feeding grounds lay distant, extending from the Encinal ridges on the Las Palomas lands to Live Oak Groves a hundred miles to the southward. But however far the pigeons might go for food, they always returned to the roosting place at night. That means pigeon pie, said Uncle Lance, on receiving Glenn's report. Everybody on the cook can go. We have only a sweet mast about every three or four years in the Encinal. But it always brings the wild pigeons. We'll take a couple of pack mules and the little and the big pot and the two biggest Dutch ovens on the ranch. Oh, you got to parboil a pigeon if you want a tender pie. Next to a fish fry, a good pigeon pie makes the finest eating going. I've made many a one, and I give notice right now that the making of the pie falls to me or I won't play. Another thing, not a bird shall be killed more than we can use. Of course we'll bring home a mess and a few apiece for the Mexicans. We had got up our horses during the forenoon, and as soon as dinner was over, the white contingent saddled up and started for the roost. Trebusio and Enrique accompanied us, and riding leisurely, we reached the bend several hours before the return of the birds. The roost had been in use but a short time, but as we scouted through the timber, there was abundant evidence of an immense flight of pigeons. The ground was literally covered with feathers. Broken limbs hung from nearly every tree, while in one instance a forked hackberry had been split from the weight of the birds. We made camp on the outskirts of the timber, and at early dusk great flocks of pigeons began to arrive at their roosting place. We only had four shotguns, and dividing into pairs we entered the roost shortly after dark. Glenn Gallup fell to me as my partner. I carried the gunny sack for the birds, not caring for a gun in such unfair shooting. The flights continued to arrive for fully an hour after we entered the roost, and in half a dozen shots we bagged over fifty birds. Remembering the admonition of Uncle Lance, Gallup refused to kill more, and we sat down and listened to the rumbling noises of the grove. There was a constant chattering of the pigeons, and as they settled in great flights in the trees overhead, whipping the branches with their wings in search of footing, they frequently fell to the ground at our feet. Gallup and I returned to the camp early. Before we had skinned our kill, the others had all come in, disgusted with the ease with which they had filled their bags. We soon had two pots filled and on the fire parboiling, while Trebusio lined two ovens with pastry, all ready for the baking. In a short time, two horsemen, attracted by our fire, crossed the river below our camp and rode up. "'Hello, Uncle Lance,' lustily shouted one of them, as he dismounted. "'It's you, isn't it, that's shooting my pigeons? All right, sir, I'll stay all night and help you eat them. I had figured on riding back to the Frio tonight, 
but I've changed my mind. Got any horse hobbles here? The two men, George Nathan and Hugh Trotter, were accommodated with hobbles, and after an exchange of commonplace news of the country, we settled down to storytelling. Trotter was a convivial acquaintance of Aaron Scales, quite a vagabond and consequently a storyteller. After Trotter had narrated a late dream, Scales unlimbered and told one of his own. I remember a dream I had several years ago, and the only way I can account for it was I had been drinking more or less during the day. I dreamt I was making a long ride across the dreary desert, and towards night it threatened a bad storm. I began to look around for some shelter. I could just see the tops of a clump of trees beyond the hill, and rode hard to get to them, thinking that there might be a house amongst them. How I did ride! But I certainly must have had a poor horse, for I never seemed to get any nearer that timber. I rode and rode, but all this time, hours and hours it seemed, and the storm gathering and scattering raindrops falling, the timber seemed scarcely any nearer. At last I managed to reach the crest of a hill. Well, sir, there wasn't a tree in sight. Only, under the brow of the hill, a deserted adobe huacal. I rode for that, picketed my horse, and went in. The huacal had a thatched roof with several large holes in it and in the fireplace burned a roaring fire. That was some strange, but I didn't mind it, and I was warming my hands before the fire and congratulating myself on my good luck when a large black cat sprang from the outside into an open window and said, Partner, it looks like a bad night outside. I eyed him a little suspiciously, but, for all that, if he hadn't spoken, I wouldn't have thought anything about it, for I like cats. He walked backwards and forwards on the window sill, his spine and tail nicely arched, and rubbed himself on either window jamb. I watched him some little time, and finally concluded to make friends with him. Going over to the window, I put out my hand to stroke his glossy back, when a gust of rain came through the window, and the cat vanished into the darkness. I went back to the fire, pitying the cat out there in the night storm and was really sorry I had disturbed him. I didn't give the matter over much attention, but sat before the fire, wondering who could have built it and listening to the rain outside, when all of a sudden Mr. Cat walked between my legs, rubbing himself against my boots, purring and singing. Once or twice I thought of stroking his fur, but checked myself on remembering that he had spoken to me on the window sill. He would walk over and rub himself against the jams of the fireplace, and then come back and rub himself against my boots friendly-like. I saw him just as clear as I see those pots on the fire or these saddles lying around here. I was noting every move of his as he meandered around, when presently he cocked up an eye at me and remarked, Old sport, this is a fine fire we have here. I was beginning to feel a little creepy, for I'd seen mad dogs and skunks, and they say a cat gets locoed likewise, and the cuss was talking so cleverly that I began to lose my regard for him. After a little while I concluded to pet him, for he didn't seem a bit afraid. But as I put out my hand to catch him, he nimbly hopped into the roaring fire and vanished. Then I did feel foolish. I had a good six-shooter and made up my mind if he showed up again I'd plug him one for luck. I was growing sleepy, and it was getting late, so I concluded to spread down my saddle blankets and slicker before the fire and go to sleep. While I was making down my bed, I happened to look towards the fire, when there was my black cat, with not even a hair singed. I drew my gun quietly and cracked away at him when he let out the funniest little laugh, saying, "'You've been drinking, Aaron. You're nervous. You couldn't hit a flock of barns.' I was getting excited by this time, and cut loose on him rapidly. But he dodged every shot, jumping from the hearth to the mantel, and from the mantel to an old table, and from there to a niche in the wall, and from the niche clear across the room and out of the window. 
About then I was some nervous, and after a while lay down before the fire and tried to go to sleep. It was a terrible night outside, one of those nights when you can hear things, and with the vivid imagination I was enjoying then, I was almost afraid to try to sleep. But just as I was going into a doze, I raised my head, and there was my cat walking up and down my frame, his back arched and his tail flirting with the slow, sinuous movement of a snake. I reached for my gun, and as it clicked in cocking, he began raking my legs, sharpening in his claws and growling like a tiger. I gave a yell and kicked him off, when he sprang up on the old table, and I could see his eyes glaring at me. I emptied my gun at him a second time, and at every shot he crouched lower and crept forward, as if getting ready to spring. When I had fired the last shot, I jumped up and ran out into the rain, and hadn't gone more than a hundred yards before I fell into a dry wash. When I crawled out, there was that damned cat rubbing himself against my bootleg. I stood breathless for a minute, thinking what next to do, and the cat remarked, Wasn't that a peach of a race we just had? I made one or two vicious kicks at him, and he again vanished. Well, fellas, in that dream, I walked around that old vacal all night in my shirt sleeves, and it raining pitchforks. A number of times I peeped in through the window or door, and there sat the cat on the hearth, in full possession of the shack, and me out in the weather. Once when I looked in, he was missing, but when I was watching, he sprang through a hole in the roof, alighting in the fire from which he walked out gingerly, shaking his feet, as if he had just been out in the wet. I shot away every cartridge I had at him, but in the middle of the shooting he would just coil up before the fire and snooze away. That night was an eternity of torment to me, and I was relieved when someone knocked on the door, and I awoke to find myself in a good bed and pounding my ear on a goose-hair pillow in a hotel in Oakville. Why, I wouldn't have another dream like that for half an interest in the Las Palomas brand. No, honest, if I thought drinking gave me that hideous dream, here would be one lad ripe for reform. It strikes me, said Uncle Lance, rising and lifting a pot lid, that these birds are parboiled by this time. Bring me a fork, Enrique. Well, I should say they were. I hope hell ain't any hotter than that fire. Now, Trebusio, if you have everything ready, we'll put them in the oven and bake them a couple of hours. Several of us assisted in fixing the fire and properly coaling the ovens. When this had been attended to, we had again resumed our easy positions around the fire. Trotter remarked, Aaron, you ought to cut drinking out of your amusements. You haven't the constitution to stand it. Now with me, it's different. I can drink a week and never sleep. That's the kind of bill to have if you expect to travel and meet all comers. Last year, I was working for a Kansas City man on the trail, and after the cattle were delivered, about a hundred miles beyond Ellsworth, up in Kansas, he sent us home by way of Kansas City. In fact, that was about the only route we could take. Well, it was a successful trip, and as this man was plumb white, anyhow, he concluded to show us the sights around his burg. He was interested in a commission firm out at the stockyards, and that night we reached there, all the office men, including the old man himself, turned themselves loose to show us a good time. We had been drinking alkali water all summer, and along about midnight they began to drop out until there was no one left to face the music except a little cattle salesman and myself. After all the others quit us, we went into a feed trough on a back street and had a good supper. I had been drinking everything like a good fellow, and at several places there was no salt to put in the beer. The idea struck me that I would buy a sack of salt from this eating ranch and take it with me. The landlord gave me a funny look, but after some little parley, went into the rear and brought out a five-pound sack of table salt. It was just what I wanted, and after paying for it, the salesman and I started out to make a night of it. The yard man was a short, fat Dutchman, 
and we made a team for your whiskers. I carried the sack of salt under my arm, and the quantity of beer we killed before daylight was a caution. About daybreak, the salesman wanted me to go to our hotel and go to bed, but as I never drink and sleep at the same time, I declined. Finally, he explained to me that he would have to be at the yards at eight o'clock, and begged me to excuse him. By this time, he was several sheets in the wind, while I could walk a chalk line without a waver. Somehow, we drifted around to the hotel where the outfit were supposed to be stopping, and lined up at the bar for a final drink. It was just daybreak, and between that Dutch cattle salesman and the barkeeper and myself, it would have taken a bookkeeper to have kept the check on the drinks we consumed, every one the last. Then the Dutchman gave me the slip and was gone, and I wandered into the office of the hotel. A newsboy sold me a paper, and the next minute a bootblack wanted to give me a shine. Well, I took a seat for a shine, and for two hours I sat there as full as a tick, and as dignified as a judge on the bench. All the newsboys and bootblacks caught on, and before any of the outfit showed up that morning to rescue me, I had bought a dozen papers and had my boots shined for the tenth time. If I had been foxy enough to have got rid of that sack of salt, no one could have told I was off the reservation. But there it was under my arm. If I ever make another trip over the trail and touch at Kansas City returning, I'll hunt up that cattle salesman, for he's the only man I ever met that can pace in my class. Did you hear that tree break a few minutes ago? inquired Mr. Nathan. There goes another one. It hardly looks possible that enough pigeons could settle on a tree to break it down. Honestly, I'd give a purdy to know how many birds there are in that roost tonight. More than there are cattle in Texas, I'll bet. Why, Hugh killed, with both barrels, twenty-two at one shot. We had brought blankets along, but it was early, and no one thought of sleeping for an hour yet. Mr. Nathan was quite a sportsman, and after he and Uncle Lance had discussed the safest method of hunting Javelina, it again devolved on the boys to entertain the party with stories. I was working on a ranch once at Glen Gallup, out on the Concho River. It was a stag outfit, there being few women then out Concho way. One day two of the boys were riding in home when an accident occurred. They had been shooting more or less during the morning, and one of them, named Bill Cook, had carelessly left the hammer of a six-shooter on a cartridge. As Bill jumped his horse over a dry arroyo, his pistol was thrown from its holster and, falling on the hard ground, was discharged. The bullet struck him in the ankle, ranged upward, shattering the large bone in his leg into fragments, and finally lodged in the saddle. They were about five miles from camp when the accident happened. After they realized how bad he was hurt, Bill remounted his horse and rode nearly a mile, but the wound bled so that the fellow with him insisted on his getting off and lying on the ground while he went into the ranch for a wagon. Well, it's to be supposed that he lost no time in riding in, and I was sent to San Angelo for a doctor. It was just about noon when I got off, and I had to ride thirty miles. Talk about your good horses. I had one that day. I took a free gait from the start, but the last ten miles was the fastest, for I covered the entire distance in less than three hours. There was a doctor in town who'd been on the frontier all his life and was used to such calls. Well, before dark that evening, we drove in to the ranch. They had got the lad into the ranch and had checked the flow of blood and eased the pain by standing on a chair and pouring water on the wound from a height. But Bill looked pale as a ghost from loss of blood. The doctor gave the leg a single look and turning to us said, boys, she's got to come off. The doctor talked to Bill freely and frankly, telling him that it was the only chance for his life. He readily consented to the operation, and while the doctor was getting him under the influence of the opiates, we fixed up an operating table. When all was ready, 
the doctor took the leg off below the knee, cursing us generally for being so sensitive to cutting and the sight of blood. There was quite a number of boys at the ranch, but it affected them all alike. It was interesting to watch them cut and tie arteries, and saw the bones, and I think I stood it better than any of them. When the operation was over, we gave the fellow the best bed the ranch afforded, and fixed him up comfortable. The doctor took the bloody stump and wrapped it up in old newspapers, saying he would take it home with him. After supper, the surgeon took a sleep, saying he would start back to town by two o'clock, so as to be there by daylight. He gave instructions to call him in case Bill awoke, but he hoped the boy would take a good sleep. As I left my horse in town, I was expected to go back with him. Shortly after midnight, the fellow awoke, so we aroused the doctor, who reported him doing well. The old doc sat by his bed for an hour and told him all kinds of stories. He had been a surgeon in the Confederate Army, and from the drift of his talk you'd think it was impossible to kill a man without cutting off his head. Now take a young fellow like you, said the doctor to his patient. If he was all shot to pieces, just so the parts would hang together, I could fix him up and he would get well. You have no idea, son, how much lead a young man can carry. We had coffee and lunch before starting, the doctor promising to send me back at once with necessary medicines. We had a very pleasant trip driving back to town that night. The stories he could tell were like a song with ninety verses, no two alike. It was hardly daybreak when we reached San Angelo, and rustled out a sleepy hostler at the livery stable where the team belonged, and had the horses cared for, and as we left the stable the doctor gave me his instrument case, while he carried the amputated leg in the paper. We both felt the need of a bracer after our night's ride, so we looked around to see if any of the saloons were open. There was only one that showed any signs of life and we headed for that. The doctor was in the lead as we entered, and we both knew the barkeeper well. This barkeeper was a practical joker himself, and he and the doctor were great hunting companions. We walked up to the bar together, when the doctor laid the package on the counter and asked, Is this good for two drinks? The barkeeper, with a look of expectation in his face, as if the package might contain half a dozen quail, or some fresh fish, broke the string and unrolled it. Without a word, he walked straight from behind the bar and out of the house. If he had been shot himself, he couldn't have looked whiter. The doctor went behind the bar and said, Glenn, what are you going to take? Let her come straight, doctor, was my reply, and we both took the same. We had the house all to ourselves, and after a second round of drinks, took our leave. As we left by the front door, we saw the barkeeper leaning against the hitching post half a block below. The doctor called to him as we were leaving. Billy, if the drinks ain't on you, charge them to me. The moon was just rising, and, at Uncle Lance's suggestion, we each carried in a turn of wood, piling a portion of it on the fire. The blaze soon lighted up the camp throwing shafts of light far into the recesses of the woods around us. In another hour, said Uncle Lance, recalling the oven lids, that smaller pie will be all ready to serve, but we'll keep the big one for breakfast. So, boys, if you want to sit up a little while longer, we'll have a midnight lunch, and then all turn in for about forty winks. As the oven lid was removed from time to time, to take note of the baking, savory odors of the pie were wafted in our anxious nostrils on the intimation that one oven would be ready in an hour not a man suggested blankets and taking advantage of the lull theodore quayle claimed attention another fellow and myself said quayle were knocking around fort worth one time seeing the sights we had drunk until it didn't taste right any longer this chum of mine was queer in his drinking. If he ever got enough once, he didn't want any more for several days. You could cure him by offering him plenty. But with just the right amount on board, he was a hale fellow. 
and he was a big, ambling, awkward cuss who could be led into anything on a hint or suggestion. We had been knocking around the town for a week until there was nothing new to be seen. Several times as we passed a millinery shop, kept by a little blonde, we had seen her standing at the door. Something, it might have been his ambling walk, but anyway something, about my chum amused her, for she smiled and watched him as we passed. He could never walk along beside you for any distance, but would trail behind and look into the windows. He could not be hurried, not in town. I mentioned to him that he had made a mash on the little blonde milliner, and he at once insisted that I should show her to him. We passed down on the opposite side of the street, and I pointed out the place. Then we walked by several times and finally passed when she was standing in the doorway talking to some customers. As we came up, he straightened himself, caught her eye, and tipped his hat with the politeness of a dancing master. She blushed to the roots of her hair, and he walked on, very erect, some little distance. Then we turned a corner and held a confab. He was for playing the whole string, discount or no discount, anyway. An excuse to go in was wanting, but we thought we could invent one. However, he needed a drink or two to facilitate his thinking and loosen his tongue. To get them was easier than the excuse but with the drinks the motive was born. "'You wait here,' said he to me, "'until I go round to the livery stable "'and get my coat off my saddle.' He never encumbered himself with extra clothing. We had not seen our horses, saddles, or any of our belongings during the week of our visit. When he returned, he inquired, "'Do I need a shave?' "'Oh, no,' I said. "'You need no shave. "'You may have a drink too many, or lack one, of having enough, but it's hard to make a close calculation on you. Then I'm all ready, said he, for I've just the right gauge of steam. He led the way as we entered. It was getting dark, and the shop was empty of customers. Where he even got the manners, heaven only knows. Once inside the door we halted, and she kept the counter between us as she approached. She ought to have called the police and had us run in. She was probably scared, but her voice was fairly steady as she spoke. Gentlemen, what can I do for you? My friend here, said he, with a bow and a wave of the hand, was unfortunate enough to lose a wager made between us. The terms of the bet were that the loser would buy a new hat for one of the dining room girls at our hotel. As we are leaving town tomorrow, we had just dropped in to see if you had anything suitable. We are both totally incompetent to decide on such a delicate matter, but we will trust entirely to your judgment in the selection. The milliner was quite collected by this time, as she asked, any particular style, and what about price? The price is immaterial, he said disdainfully. Any man who will wager on the average weight of a train load of cattle, his own cattle, mind you, and miss them twenty pounds, ought to pay for his lack of judgment. Don't you think so, Miss, uh, uh? Excuse me for being unable to call your name, but, but? Dement is my name, said she, with some little embarrassment. Livingston is mine, said he, with a profound bow. And this gentleman is Mr. Ocklatree, younger brother of the Congressman Tom. Now regarding the style, we will depend entirely upon your selection but possibly the loser is entitled to some choice in the matter. Mr. Ocklatree, have you any preferences in regard to style? Why, no. I can generally tell whether a hat becomes a lady or not, but as the selecting one, I am at sea. We had better depend on Miss DeMint's judgment. Still, I always like an abundance of flowers on a lady's hat. Whenever a girl walks down the street ahead of me, I like to watch the posies, grass, and buds on her hat wave and nod with the motion of her walk. Miss DeMent, don't you agree with me that an abundance of flowers becomes a young lady? And this girl can't be over twenty. Well now, said she, going into the matters in earnest, I can scarcely advise you. Is the young lady a brunette or blonde? What difference does it make? he innocently asked. 
oh said she smiling we must harmonize colors what would suit one complexion would not become another what color is her hair nearly the color of yours said he not so heavy and lacks the natural wave which yours has but she's all right she can ride a string of my horses until they all have sore backs i tell you she's a cute trick but say miss dement what do you think of a green hat broad-brimmed turned up behind and on one side long black feathers run round and turn up behind with a blue bird on the other side swooping down like a pigeon hawk long tail feathers and an arrow in its beak that strikes me as about the mustard what do you think of that kind of hat dear why sir the colors don't harmonize she replied blushing theodore do you know anything about this harmony of colors excuse me madam and i crave your pardon mr ochlatree for using your given name but really this harmony of colors is all french to me well if the young lady is in town why can't you ever drop in and make her own selection suggested the blonde milliner he just studied a moment and then awoke as if from a trance just as easy as not this very evening or in the morning strange we didn't think of that sooner yes the landlady of the hotel can join us and we can count on your assistance in selecting the hat with a number of comments on her attractive place inquiries regarding trade and flattering compliments on having made such a charming acquaintance we edged towards the door this evening then or in the morning at the farthest you may expect another call when my friend must pay the penalty of his folly by settling the bill put it on heavy and he gave her a parting wink together we bowed ourselves out and once safe in the street he said didn't she help us out of that easy if she wasn't a blonde i'd go back and buy her two hats for suggesting it as she did rather good-looking too i remarked oh well that's a matter of taste i like people with red blood in them now if you was to saw off her arm it wouldn't bleed just a little white water might ooze out possibly the best-looking girl i ever saw was down in the lower rio grande country and she was milking a goat theodore my dear fellow when I am led blushingly to the altar, you'll be proud of my choice. I'm a judge of beauty. It was after midnight when we disposed of the first oven of pigeon pot pie, and wrapping ourselves in blankets, lay down around the fire. With the first sign of dawn, we were aroused by Mr. Nathan and Uncle Lance to witness the return flight of the birds to their feeding grounds. Hurrying to the nearest opening, we saw the immense flight of pigeons blackening the sky overhead stiffened by their night's rest they flew low but the beauty and immensity of the flight overawed us and we stood in mute admiration no one firing a shot for fully half an hour the flight continued ending in a few scattering birds end of chapter five chapter six of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Spring of seventy six. The spring of seventy six was eventful at La Palomas. After the pigeon hunt, Uncle Lance went to San Antonio to sell cattle for spring delivery. Meanwhile, Father Norquin visited the ranch and spent a few days among his parishioners. Miss Jean acting the hostess in behalf of Las Palomas. The priest proved a congenial fellow of the cloth, and among us, with Miss Jean's countenance, it was decided not to delay Enrique's marriage, for there was no telling when Uncle Lance would return. All the arrangements were made by the padre and Miss Jean, the groom-to-be apparently playing a minor part in the preliminaries. Though none of the white element of the ranch were communicants of his church, the priest apparently enjoyed the visit. At parting, the mistress pressed a gold piece into his chubby palm as the marriage fee for Enrique, and, after naming a day for the ceremony, the padre mounted his horse and left us for the Tarancalis, 
showering his blessings on Las Palomas and its people. During the intervening days before the wedding, we overhauled an unused jacal and made it habitable for the bride and groom. The jacal is a crude structure of this semi-tropical country, containing but a single room with a shady, protecting stoop. It is constructed by standing palisades on end in a trench. These constitute the walls. The floor is earthen, while the roof is thatched with the wild grass which grows rank in the overflow portions of the river valley. It forms a serviceable shelter for a warm country, the particular roofing equally defying rain and the sun's heat. Under the leadership of the mistress of the ranch, assisted by the Mexican woman, the jacal was transformed into a rustic bower, for Enrique was not only a favorite among the whites, but also among his own people. A few gaudy pictures of saints and the Madonna ornamented the side walls, while in the rear hung the necessary crucifix. At the time of its building, the jacal had been blessed, as was customary before occupancy, and to Enrique's reasoning, the potency of the former sprinkling still held good. Weddings were momentous occasions among the Mexican population at Las Palomas. In outfitting the party to attend Enrique's wedding at Santa Maria, the ranch came to a standstill. Not only the regular ambulance, but a second conveyance was required to transport the numerous female relatives of the groom, while the men, all in gala attire, were mounted on the best horses of the ranch. As none of the whites attended, Deweese charged Tribucio with humanity to the stock, while the mistress admonished everyone to be on his good behavior. With greetings to Santa Maria, the wedding party set out. They were expected to return the following evening, and the ranch was set in order to give the bride a rousing reception on her arrival at Las Palomas. The largest place on the ranch was a warehouse, and we shifted its contents in such a manner has to have quite a commodious ballroom. The most notable decoration of the room was an immense heart-shaped figure, in which was worked in live oak leaves the names of the two ranches, flanked on either side with the American and Mexican flags. Numerous other decorations expressing welcome to the bride were in evidence on every hand. Tallow was plentiful at Las Palomas, and candles were fastened at every possible projection. The mounted members of the wedding party returned near the middle of the afternoon. According to reports, Santa Maria had treated them most hospitably. The marriage was simple, but the festivities following had lasted until dawn. The returning guests sought their wakals to snatch a few hours' sleep before the revelry would be resumed at Las Palomas. An hour before sunset, the four mule ambulance bearing the bride and groom drove into Las Palomas with a flourish. Before leaving the bridal couple at their own jacal, Tribucio halted the ambulance in front of the ranch house for the formal welcome. In the absence of her brother, Miss Jean officiated in behalf of Las Palomas, tenderly caressing the bride. The boys monopolized her with their congratulations and welcome, which delighted Enrique. As for the bride, she seemed at home from the first, soon recognizing me as the Padrino Segundo at the time of her betrothal. Quite a delegation of the bride's friends from Santa Maria accompanied the party on their return, from whom were chosen part of the musicians for the evening. Violin and guitars in the hands of the native element of these two ranches making up a pastoral orchestra. I volunteered my services, but so much of the music was new to me that I frequently excused myself for a dance with the senoritas. In the absence of Uncle Lance, our segundo, June Deweese, claimed the first dance of the evening with the bride. Miss Jean lent only the approval of her presence, not participating, and withdrawing at an early hour. As all the American element present spoke Spanish slightly, that became the language of the evening. But further than the countenance with our presence, the festivities, we were out of place, and ere midnight all had excused themselves, with the exception of Aaron Scales and myself. 
on the pleadings of Enrique, I remained an hour or two longer, dancing with his bride, or playing some favorite selection for the delighted groom. Several days after the wedding, Uncle Lance returned. He had been successful in contracting a trail herd of thirty-five hundred cattle, and a remuda of one hundred and twenty-five saddle horses with which to handle them. The contract called for two thousand two-year-old steers and fifteen hundred threes. There was a difference of four dollars a head in favor of the older cattle, and it was the ranchero's intention to fill the latter class entirely from the Las Palomas brand. As to the younger cattle, neighboring ranches would be invited to deliver twos in filling the contract, and if any were lacking, the home ranch would supply the deficiency. Having ample range, the difference in price was an inducement to hold the younger cattle. To keep a steer another year cost nothing, while the ranchero returned convinced that the trail might soon furnish an outlet for all surplus cattle. In the matter of the horses, too, rather than reduce our supply of saddle stock below the actual needs of the ranch, Uncle Lance concluded to buy fifty head in making up the remuda. There were several hundred geldings on the ranch old enough for saddle purposes, but they would be as good as useless in handling cattle the first year after breaking. As this would be the first trail herd from Las Palomas, we naturally felt no small pride in the transaction. According to contract, everything was to be ready for final delivery on the 25th of March. The contractors, Camp and Dupre of Fort Worth, Texas, were to send their foreman two weeks in advance to receive, classify, and pass upon the cattle and saddle stock. They were exacting in their demands, yet humane and reasonable. In making up the herd, no cattle were to be corralled at night, and no animal would be received which had been roped. The saddle horses were to be treated likewise. These conditions would put into the saddle every available man on the ranch as well as on the ranchitas. But we looked eagerly forward to the putting up of the herd. Letters were written and dispatched to a dozen ranches within striking distance, inviting them to turn in two-year-old steers at the full contract price. June Deweese was sent out to buy fifty saddle horses, which would fill the required standard. Fourteen hands or better, serviceable and gentle broke. I was dispatched to Santa Maria to invite Don Mateo Gonzales to participate in the contract. The range of every saddle horse on the ranch was located, so that we could gather them, when wanted, in a day. Less than a month's time now remained before the delivery day, though we did not expect to go into camp for actual gathering until the arrival of the trail foreman. In going and returning from San Antonio, my employer had traveled by stage. As it happened, the driver of the upstage out of Oakville was Jack Martin, the son-in-law of Mrs. McLeod. He and Uncle Lance being acquainted, the old ranchero's matchmaking instincts had, during the day's travel, again forged to the front. By roundabout inquiries he had elicited the information that Mrs. McLeod had, immediately after the holidays, taken Esther to San Antonio and placed her in school. By innocent artful suggestions of his interest in the welfare of the family, he learned the name of the private school of which Esther was a pupil. Furthermore, he cultivated the good will of the driver in various ways over good cigars, and at parting assured him on returning he would take the stage so as to have the pleasure of his company on the return trip, the highest compliment that could be paid a stage driver. From several sources I had learned that Esther had left the ranch for the city, but on Uncle Lance's return I got the full particulars. As a neighboring ranchman, and bearing self-invented messages from the family, he had the assurance to call at the school. His honest countenance was a passport anywhere, and he not only saw Esther, but prevailed on her teachers to give the girl, some time during his visit in the city, a half-holiday. The interest he manifested in the girl won his request, and the two had spent an afternoon 
visiting the parks and other points of interest. It is needless to add that he made hay in my behalf during this half-holiday, but the most encouraging fact that he unearthed was that Esther was disgusted with her school life and was homesick. She had declared that if she ever got away from school, no power on earth could force her back again. "'Shucks, Tom,' said he, the next morning after his return, as we were sitting in the shade of the corrals waiting for the remuda to come in, that poor little country girl might as well be in a penitentiary as in that school. She belongs on these prairies, and you can't make anything else out of her. I can read between the lines, and anyone can see that her education is finished. When she told me how rudely her mother had treated you, her heart was an open book and easily read. Don't you lose any sleep on how you stand in her affections. That's all serene. She'll be home on a spring vacation, and that'll be your chance. If I was your age, I'd make it a point to see that she didn't go back to school. She'll run off with you rather than that. In the game of matrimony, son, you want to play your cards boldly and never hesitate to lead trumps. To further matters, when returning by stage, my employer had ingratiated himself into the favor of the driver in many ways, and urged him to send word to Mrs. McLeod to turn in her two-year-olds on his contract. A few days later her foreman and son-in-law, Tom Hunter, rode down to Las Palomas, anxious for the chance to turn in cattle. There had been little opportunity for several years to sell steers, and when a chance like this came, there would have been no trouble to fill a half a dozen contracts, as supply far exceeded demand. Uncle Lance let Mrs. McLeod's foreman feel that allotting her five hundred of the younger cattle, he was actuated by old-time friendship for the family. As a mark of special consideration, he promised to send the trail foreman to the San Miguel to pass on the cattle on their home range but advised the foreman to gather at least seven hundred steers, allowing for two hundred to be culled or cut back. Hunter remained overnight, departing the next morning, delighted over his allowance of cattle and the liberal terms of the contract. It was understood that, in advance of his outfit, the trail foreman would come down by stage, and I was sent into Oakville with an extra saddle horse to meet him. He had arrived the day previous, and we lost no time in starting for Las Palomas. This trail foreman was about thirty years of age, a quiet, red-headed fellow, given the name of Frank Nancredi. And before we had covered half the distance to the ranch, I was satisfied that he was a cowman. I always prided myself on possessing a good eye for brands, but he outclassed me reading strange brands at over a hundred yards, and distinguishing cattle from horse stock at a distance of three miles. We got fairly well acquainted before reaching the ranch, but it was impossible to start him on any subject save cattle. I was able to give him a very good idea of the remuda, which was then under herd and waiting his approval, and I saw the man brighten into a smile for the first time on my offering to help him pick out a good mount for his own saddle. I had a vague idea of what the trail was like, and felt the usual boyish attractions for it. But when I tried to draw him out in regard to it, he advised me, if I had a regular job on a ranch, to let trail work alone. We reached the ranch late in the evening, and I introduced Dan Creedy to Uncle Lance, who took charge of him. We had established a horse camp for the trail remuda, north of the river, and the next morning the trail foreman, my employer, and June DeWeese rode over to pass on the saddle stock. The remuda pleased him, being fully up to the contract standard, and he accepted it with but a single exception. This exception tickled Uncle Lance, as it gave him an opportunity to annoy his sister about Nancredi as he did about every other cowman or drover who visited the ranch. That evening, as I was chatting with Miss Jean, who was superintending the Mexican help milking at the cow pen, Uncle Lance joined us. "'Say, sis,' said he, "'our man Nancredi is a cowman, all right. I tried to ring in a hipped horse on him this morning. 
one hip knocked down just the least little bit, but he noticed it and refused to accept him. Oh, he's got an eye in his head all right, so if you say so, I'll give him the best horse on the ranch in old Hippie's place. You're always making fun of slab-sided cowmen. He's pony built enough to suit you, and I kind of like the color of his hair myself. Did you notice his neck? He'll never tie it if it gets broken. I like a short man, but if he stubs his toe and falls down, he doesn't reach halfway home. Now if he has as good cow sense in receiving the herd as he had on the remuda, I'd kind of like to have him for a brother-in-law. I'm getting a little too old for active work and would like to retire. But June, the darn fool, won't get married, and about the only show I've got is to get a husband for you. I'd as lief live in Hades as on a ranch without a woman on it. What do you think of him? Why, well, I think he's an awfully nice fellow, but he won't talk. And besides, I'm not baiting my hook for small fish like the trail foreman. I was aiming to keep my smiles for the contractors. Aren't they coming down? Well, they might come down to look the herd over before it starts out. Now Dupre is a good cowman, but he's got a wife already, and Camp, the financial man of the firm, made his money peddling Yankee clocks. Now you don't suppose for a moment that I'd let you marry him and carry you away from Las Palomas? Marry an old clock peddler? Not if he had a million. The idea. If they come down here and I catch you smiling, old camp, I'll set the hounds on you. What you want to do is set your cap for Nancrede, of course. You're ten years the elder, but that needn't cut any figure. So just burn a few smiles on the red-headed trail foreman. You know you can count on your loving brother to help all he can. The conversation was interrupted by our segundo and the trail foreman riding up to the cow pen. The two had been up the river during the afternoon looking over the cattle on the range, for as yet we had not commenced gathering. Nan Creedy was very reticent, discovering a conspicuous lack of words to express his opinion of what cattle Deweese had shown him. The second day after the arrival of the trail foreman, we divided our forces into two squads and started out to gather our three-year-olds. By the ranch records, there were over two thousand steers at that age in the Las Palomas brand. Deweese took ten men and half of the ranch saddle horses and went up above the mouth of the Ganso to begin gathering. Uncle Lance took the remainder of the men and the horses and went down the river nearly to Shepherd's, leaving Dan Happersett and three Mexicans to hold and night herd the trail remuda. Nan Creedy declined to stay at the ranch, and so joined our outfit on the down-river trip. We had postponed the gathering until the last hour, for every day improved the growing grass on which our mounts must depend for subsistence, and once we started there would be little rest for men or horses. The younger cattle of the herd were made up within a week, after the invitations were sent to the neighboring ranches. Naturally, they would be the last cattle to be received, and would come in for delivery between the twentieth and the last of the month. With the plans thus outlined, we started our gathering. Counting Nancrede, we had twelve men in the saddle in our down-river outfit. Taking nothing but three-year-olds, we did not accumulate cattle fast. But it was continuous work, every man with the exception of Uncle Lance, standing a guard on night herd. The first two days we only gathered about five hundred steers. This number was increased by about three hundred on the third day, and that evening Dan Happersett, with a vaquero, rode into camp and reported that Nancrede's outfit had arrived from San Antonio. He had turned the remuda over to them on their arrival, sending the other two Mexicans to join Deweese above on the river. The fourth day finished the gathering. Nancrede remained with us to the last, making a hand which left no doubt in anyone's mind that he was a cowman from the ground up. The last roundup on the afternoon of the fourth day, our outriders sighted the vaqueros from Deweese's outfit, circling and drifting in the cattle 
on their half of the circle. The next morning the two camps were thrown together on the river opposite the ranch. Deweese had fully as many cattle as we had, and when the two cuts had been united and counted, we lacked but five heads of nineteen hundred. Several of Nancrede's men joined us that morning, and within an hour, under the trail foreman's directions, we cut back the overplus, and the cattle were accepted. Under the contract we were to road brand them, though Nancrede ordered his men to assist us in the work. Under ordinary circumstances, we should also have vented the ranch brand, but owing to the fact that this herd was to be trailed to Abilene, Kansas, and possibly sold beyond that point, it was unnecessary and therefore omitted. We had a branding chute on the ranch for grown cattle, and the following morning the herd was corralled and the road branding commenced. The cattle were uniform in size, and the stamping of the figure four over the holding lazy L of the Las Palomas moved like clockwork. With a daybreak start and an abundance of help, the last animal was ironed up before sundown. As a favor to Nancrede's outfit, their camp being nearly five miles distance, we held them the first night after branding. No sooner had the trail foreman accepted our three-year-olds than he and Glenn Gallup set out for the McLeod Ranch on the San Miguel. The day our branding was finished, the two returned near midnight, reported the San Miguel cattle accepted, and due the next evening at Las Palomas. By dawn, Nancrede and myself started for Santa Maria, the former being deficient in Spanish, the only weak point, if it was one, in his makeup as a cowman. We were slightly disappointed in not finding the cattle ready to pass upon at Santa Maria. That ranch was to deliver seven hundred, and on our arrival they had not even that number under herd. Don Mateo, an easy-going ranchero, could not understand the necessity of such haste. What did it matter if the cattle were delivered on the twenty-fifth or twenty-seventh? But I explained, as delicately as I could, that this was a trail man whose vocabulary did not contain manana. In interpreting for Nancrede, I learned something of the trail myself, that a herd should start with the grass and move with it, keeping the freshness of spring day after day, week after week, as they trailed northward. The trail foreman assured Don Mateo that had his employers known that this was to be such an early spring, the herd would have started a week sooner. By impressing on the ranchero the importance of not delaying this trail man, we got him to inject a little action into his corporal. We asked Don Mateo for horses, and joining his outfit, made three rodeos that afternoon, and turning into cattle under herd, nearly two hundred and fifty head by dark that evening. Nan Creedy spent a restless night, and at dawn, as the cattle were leaving the bed ground, he and I got an easy count on them, and called them down to the required number before breakfasting. We had some little trouble explaining to Don Mateo the necessity of giving the bill of sale to my employer, who in turn would reconvey the stock to the contractors. Once the matter was clear, the accepted cattle were started for Las Palomas. When we overtook them an hour afterward, I instructed the corporal at the insistence of the red-headed foreman, to take a day and a half in reaching the ranch, that tardiness and gathering must not be made up by a hasty drive to the point of delivery, that the animals must be treated humanely. On reaching the ranch we found that Mr. Booth and some of his neighbors had arrived from the Frio with their contingent. They had been allotted six hundred head, and had brought down about two hundred extra cattle in order to allow some choice in accepting. These were the only mixed brands that came in on the delivery, and after they had been culled down and accepted, my employer appointed Aaron Scales as clerk. There were some five or six owners, and Scales must catch the brands as they were freed from the branding chute. Several of the owners kept a private tally, but not once did they have occasion to check up the Marylanders' decisions. Before the branding of this bunch was finished, Wilson, from Ramarina, 
rode into the ranch and announced his cattle within five miles of Las Palomas. As these were the last two hundred to be passed upon, Dan Creedy asked to have them in sight of the ranch by sunup in the morning. On the arrival of the trail outfit from San Antonio, they brought a letter from the contractors, asking that a conveyance meet them at Oakville, as they wished to see the herd before it started. Tiburcio went in with the ambulance to meet them, and they reached the ranch late at night. On their arrival, 2,600 of the cattle had already been passed upon, branded, and were then being held by Nancredi's outfit across the river at their camp. Dupre, being a practical cowman, understood the situation, but camp was restless and uneasy, as if he expected to find the cattle in the corrals at the ranch. Camp was years the older of the two, a pudgy man with a florid complexion and nasal twang, and kept the junior member busy answering his questions. Uncle Lance enjoyed the situation, jollying his sister about the elder contractor, and quietly inquiring of the red-headed foreman how and where Dupre had picked him up. The contractors had brought no saddles with them, so the ambulance was the only mode of travel. As we rode out to receive the Wilson cattle the next morning, Uncle Lance took advantage of the occasion to jolly Nancredi further about the senior member of the firm. The foreman smiling appreciatively. The way your old man talked last night, said he, you'd think he expected to find the herd in the front yard. Too bad to disappoint him, for then he could have looked them over with a lantern from the gallery of the house. Now, if they had been Yankee clocks instead of cattle, why, he'd been right at home, and could have taken them in the house and handled them easily. It certainly beats the Dickens why some men want to break in to cattle business. It won't surprise me if he asks you to trail the herd past the ranch so he can see them. Well, you and Dupre will have to make him some dinero this summer, or you will lose him for a partner. I can see that sticking out. We received and branded the 200 Wilson cattle that forenoon, sending them to the main herd across the river. Mr. Wilson and Uncle Lance were great cronies, and as the latter was feeling in fine fettle over the successful fulfillment of his contract, he was tempted also to jolly his neighbor's ranchero over his cattle, which, by the way, were fine. Nate, he said to Mr. Wilson, it looks like you'd quit breeding goats and rear cattle instead. Honest, if I didn't know your brand, I'd swear some Mexican raised this bunch. These Fort Worth cowmen are an easy lot, or yours would have never passed under the classification. An hour before noon, Thomas Martinez, the corporal of Santa Maria, rode up to inquire what time we wished his cattle at the corrals. They were back several miles, and he could deliver them on an hour's notice. One o'clock was agreed upon and never dismounting, the corporal galloped away to his herd. Quirk, said Nancredi to me, noticing the Mexican's unaccustomed air of enterprise, if we had that fellow under us a while, we'd make a cow hand out of him. See the wiggle he gets on himself now, will you? Promptly at the hour, the herd were counted and corralled. Don Mateo Gonzalez not troubling to appear, which was mystifying to the North Texas men. But Uncle Lance explained that a mere incident like selling seven hundred cattle was not sufficient occasion to arouse the rancheros of Santa Maria when his corporal could attend to the business. That evening saw the last of the cattle branded. The herd was completed and ready to start the following morning. The two contractors were driven across the river during the afternoon to look over the herd and remuda. At the instance of my employer, I wrote a letter of congratulations to Don Mateo, handing it to his corporal, informing him that in the course of ten days a check would be sent him in payment. Uncle Lance had fully investigated the financial standing of the contractors, but it was necessary for him to return with them to San Antonio for the final settlement. The ambulance made an early start for Oakville on the morning of the 26th, carrying the contractors and my employer, and the rest of us rode away to witness the start of the herd. Nan Creedy's outfit numbered fifteen, a cook, 
a horse wrangler, himself and twelve outriders. They comprised an odd mixture of men, several barely my age, while others were gray-haired and looked like veteran cowhands. On leaving the Nueces Valley, the herd was strung out a mile in length, and after riding with them until they reached the first hills, we bade them good-bye. As we started to return, Frank Nancredi made a remark to June DeWeese, which I have often recalled. You fellows may think this is a snap, but if I had a job on as good a ranch as Las Palomas, you'd never catch me on a cattle trail. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. San Jacinto Day. A few days later, when Uncle Lance returned from San Antonio, we had a confidential talk, and he decided not to send me with a McLeod check to the San Miguel. He had reasons of his own, and I was dispatched to the Frio instead, while to Enrique fell the pleasant task of a similar errand to Santa Maria. In order to grind an axe, Glen Gallup was sent down to Wilson's with a settlement for the Ramanera cattle, which Uncle Lance made the occasion of a jovial expression of his theory of love-making. "'Don't waste any words with old man Nate,' said he, as he handed Glenn the check, but build right up to Miss Julie. Holy snakes, boy, if I was your age, I would make her dizzy with a big talk. Tell her you're thinking of quitting Las Palomas and driving a trail herd yourself next year. Tell it big and scary. Make her eyes fairly bulge out. And when you can't think of anything else, tell her she's pretty. I spent a day or two at the Booth Ranch, and on my return found the Las Palomas outfit in the saddle working our horse stock. Yearly we made up new manadas from the two-year-old fillies. There were enough young mares to form twelve bands of about twenty-five head each. In selecting these we were governed by standard colors, bays, browns, grays, blacks, and sorrels, forming separate manadas, while all mongrel colors went into two bands by themselves. In the latter class there was a tendency for the colors of the old Spanish stock, coyotes, and other hybrid mixtures, after being dormant for generations, to crop out again. In breaking these fillies into new bands, we added a stallion a year or two older and of acceptable color, and they were placed in charge of a trusty vaquero, whose duty was to herd them for the first month after being formed. The Mexican in charge usually took the band round the circuit of the various ranchitas, corralling his charge at night, drifting at will. So by the end of the month old associations would be severed, and from that time the stallion could be depended on as herdsmen. In gathering the fillies we also cut out all the geldings three years old and upwards to break for saddle purposes. There were fully two hundred of these and the month of April was spent in saddle-breaking this number. They were a fine lot of young horses, and under the master eye of two perfect horsemen, our segundo and employer, every horse was broken with intelligence and humanity. Since the day of their branding as colts, these geldings had never felt the touch of a human hand, and it required more than ordinary patience to overcome their fear, bringing them to a condition of submission, and making serviceable ranch horses out of them. The most difficult matter was in overcoming their fear. It was also necessary to show the mastery of man over the animal, though this process was tempered with humanity. We had several circular sandy corrals into which the horse to be broken was admitted for the first saddling. As he ran round, a lasso, skillfully thrown, encircled his front feet, and he came down on his side. One forefoot was strapped up, a hackamore or bitless bridle was adjusted in place, and he was allowed to arise. After this 
all depended on the patience and firmness of the handler. Some horses yielded to kind advances and accepted the saddle within half an hour, not even offering to pitch, while others repelled every kindness and fought for hours. But in handling the gelding of spirit, we could always count on the help of an extra saddler. While this work was being done, the herd of geldings was held close at hand. After the first riding, four horses were the daily allowance of each rider. With the amount of help available, this allowed twelve to fifteen horses to the man, so that every animal was ridden once in three or four days. Rather than corral, we night herded, penning them by dawn and riding our first horse before sunup. As they gradually yielded, we increased our number to six a day, and finally, before the breaking was over, to eight. When the work was finally over, they were cut into remudas of fifty horses each, furnished a gentle bell mare, when possible, with a young colt by her side, and were turned over to similar treatment as was given the fillies in forming manadas. Thus, the different remudas at Las Palomas always took the name of the bell mayor, and when we were at work it was only necessary for us to hobble the princess at night to ensure the presence of her band in the morning. When this month's work was two-thirds over, we enjoyed a holiday. All good Texans, whether by birth or adoption, celebrate the 21st of April, San Jacinto Day. National holidays may not always be observed in sparsely settled communities but this event will remain a great anniversary until the sons and daughters of the Lone Star State lose their patriotism or forget the blessings of liberty. As Shepherd's Ferry was centrally located, it became, by common consent, the meeting point for our local celebration. Residents from the Frio and San Miguel, and as far south on the home river as Legarto, including the villagers of Oakville, usually lent their presence on this occasion. The white element of Las Palomas was present without exception. As usual, Miss Jean went by ambulance, starting the afternoon before and spending the night at a ranch above the ferry. Those remaining made a daybreak start, reaching Shepherd's by ten in the morning. While on the way from the ranch to the ferry, I was visited with some misgivings as the weather Esther McLeod had yet returned from San Antonio. At the delivery of San Miguel's cattle at Las Palomas, Miss Jean had been very attentive to Tony Hunter, Esther's brother-in-law, and through him she learned that Esther's school closed for summer vacation on the 15th of April, and that within a week afterward she was expected at home. Shortly after our reaching the ferry, a number of vehicles drove in from Oakville. One of these conveyances was an elaborate six-horse stage, owned by Bethel and Oxenford, star route mail contractors between San Antonio and Brownsville, Texas. Seated by young Oxenford's side in the driver's box sat Esther McLeod, while inside the coach was her sister, Mrs. Martin, with the senior member of the firm, his wife, and several others invited guests. I had heard something of the gallantry of young Jack Oxenford, who was the nephew of a carpet-bag member of Congress, and prided himself of being the best whip in the country. In the latter field, I would gladly have yielded him all honors, but his attentions to Esther were altogether too marked to please either me or my employer. I am free to admit that I was troubled by this turn of affairs. The junior mail contractor, made up in egotism, what he lacked in appearance, and no doubt had money to burn, as star route mail contracting was profitable those days, while I had nothing but my monthly wages. To make matters more embarrassing, a blind man could have read Mrs. Martin's approval of young Oxenford. The program for the forenoon was brief. A few patriotic songs and an oration by a young lawyer who had come up from Corpus Christi for the occasion. After listening to the opening song, my employer and I took a stroll down by the river, 
as we were too absorbed in the new complications to pay proper attention to the young orator. Tom, said Uncle Lance, as we strolled away from the grove, we are up against the real thing now. I know young Oxenford, and he's a dangerous fellow to have for a rival, if he really is one. You can't tell much about a Yankee, though, for he's usually egotistical enough to think that every girl in the country is breaking her neck to win him. The worst of it is, this young fellow is rich. He's got dead oodles of money, and he's making more every hour out of his mail contracts. One good thing is we understand the situation, and all's fair in love and war. You can see, though, that Mrs. Martin has dealt herself a hand in the game. By the dough on her fingers, she proposes to have a fist in the pie. Well, now, son, we'll give them a run for their money or break a tug in the effort. Tom, you just play to my lead today, and we'll see who holds high cards or knows best how to play them. If I can cut them off, that'll be your chance to sail in and do a little close herding yourself. We loitered along the river bank until the oration was concluded my employer giving me quite an interesting account of my rival. It seems that young Oxenford belonged to a family then notoriously prominent in politics. He had inherited quite a sum of money and, through the influence of his congressional uncle, had been fortunate enough to form a partnership with Bethel, a man who knew all the ropes in mail contracting. The senior member of the firm knew how to shake the tree while the financial resources of the junior member and the political influence of his uncle made him a valuable man in gathering the plums on their large field of star route contracts. Had not exposure interrupted, they were due to have made a large fortune out of the government. On our return to the picnic grounds, the assembly was dispersing for luncheon. Miss Jean had ably provided for the occasion and on reaching our ambulance on the outer edge of the grove, Tiburcio had coffee all ready, and the boys from the home ranch began to straggle in for dinner. Miss Jean had prevailed on Tony Hunter and his wife, who had come down on horseback from the San Miguel, to take luncheon with us, and from the hearty greetings which Uncle Lance extended to the guests of his sister, I could see that the owner and mistress of Las Palomas were diplomatically dividing the house of MacLeod. I followed suit, making myself agreeable to Mrs. Hunter, who was but a very few years the elder of Esther. Having spent a couple of nights at their ranch, and feeling a certain comradeship with her husband, I decided before dinner was over that I had a friend and ally in Tony's wife. There was something romantic about the young matron, as any one could see and since the sisters favored each other in many ways, I had hopes that Esther might not overvalue Jack Oxenford's money. After luncheon, as we were on our way to the dancing arbor, we met the Oakville party with Esther in tow. I was introduced to Mrs. Martin, who in turn made me acquainted with her friends, including her sister, perfectly unconscious that we were already more than mere acquaintances. From the demure manner of Esther, who accepted the introduction as a matter of course, I surmised she was concealing our acquaintance from her sister and my rival. We had hardly reached the arbor before Uncle Lance created a diversion and interested the male contractors with a glowing yarn about a fine lot of young mules he had at the ranch, large enough for stage purposes. There was some doubt expressed by the stage men as to their size and weight, when my employer invited them to the outskirts of the grove, where he would show them a sample in our ambulance team. So he led them away, and I saw that the time had come to play my employer's lead. The music striking up, I claimed Esther for the first dance, leaving Mrs. Martin, for the time being, in charge of her sister and Miss Jean. Before the first waltz ended, I caught sight of all three of the ladies mingling in the dance. It was a source of no small satisfaction to me to see my two best friends, Deweese and Gallup, dancing with the married sisters, 
while Miss Jean was giving her whole attention to her partner, Tony Hunter. With the entire Las Palomas crowd pulling strings in my interest and father, in the absence of Oxenford, becoming extremely gracious, I grew bold and threw out my chest like the brisket on a beef steer. I permitted no one to separate me from Esther. We started the second dance together, but no sooner did I see her sister, Mrs. Martin, whirl by us in the polka with Dan Happersett, than I suggested that we drop out and take a stroll. She consented, and we were soon out of sight, wandering in a labyrinth of lovers' lanes, which abounded throughout this live oak grove. On reaching the outskirts of the picnic grounds, we came to an extensive opening in which our saddle horses were picketed. At glance, Esther recognized Wolf, the horse I had ridden the Christmas before when passing their ranch. Being a favorite saddle horse of the old ranchero, he was reserved for special occasions, and Uncle Lance had ridden him down the shepherds on this holiday. Like a bird freed from a cage, the ranch girl took to the horses and insisted on a little ride. Since her proposal alone prevented my making a similar suggestion, I allowed myself to be won over, but came near getting caught in protesting. But you told me at the ranch that Wolf was one of ten in your Las Palomas mount, she poutingly protested. He is, I insisted, but I have loaned him to Uncle Lance for the day. Throw the saddle on him, then. I'll tell Mr. Lovelace when we return that I borrowed his horse when he wasn't looking. Had she killed the horse, I felt sure that the apology would have been accepted. So throwing saddles on the black and my own mount, we were soon scampering down the river. The inconvenience of a man's saddle, or the total absence of any, was a negligible incident to this daughter of the plains. A mile down the river we halted and watered the horses. Then crossing the stream, we spent about an hour circling slowly about on the surrounding uplands, never being over a mile from the picnic grounds. It was late for the first flora of the season, but there was still an abundance of blue bonnets. Dismounting, we gathered and wove wreaths for our horses' necks, and wandered, picking the Mexican strawberries which grew plentifully on every hand. But this was all preliminary to the main question. When it came up for discussion, this one of Quirk's boys made the talk of his life in behalf of Thomas Moore. Nor was it in vain when Esther apologized for the rudeness her mother had shown me at her home. That afforded me the opening for which I was longing. We were sitting on a grassy hummock weaving garlands, when I replied to the apology by declaring my intention of marrying her, with her without her mother's consent. Unconventional as the declaration was, to my surprise she showed neither offense nor wonderment. Dropping the flowers with which we were working, she avoided my gaze, and turning slightly from me, began watching our horses, which had strayed away some distance but I gave her little time for meditation, and when I aroused her from a reverie, she rose, saying, We'd better go back. They'll miss us if we stay too long. Before complying with her wish, I urged an answer, but she artfully avoided my question, insisted on our immediate return. Being in a quandary as to what to say or do, I went after the horses, which was a simple proposition. On my return, while we were adjusting the garlands about the necks of our mounts, I again urged her for an answer, but in vain. We stood for a moment between the two horses, and as I lowered my hand on my knee to afford her a stepping stone in mounting, I thought she did not offer to mount with the same alacrity as she had done before. Something flashed through my addled mind, and withdrawing the hand proffered as a mounting block, I clasped the demure maiden closely in my arms. What transpired had no witnesses, save two saddle horses, and as Wolf usually kept an eye on his rider in mounting, I dropped the reins and gave him his freedom rather than endure his scrutiny. 
when we were finally aroused from this delicious trance, the horses had strayed away fully fifty yards. But I had received a favorable answer, breathed in a voice so low and tender that it haunts me yet. As we rode along, returning to the grove, Esther requested that our betrothal be kept the profound secret. No doubt she had good reasons, and it was quite possible that there then existed some complications which she wished to conceal, though I avoided all mention of any possible rival. Since she was not due to return to her school before September, there seemed ample time to carry out our intention of marrying. But as we jogged along, she informed me that after spending a few weeks with her sister in Oakville, it was her intention to return to the San Miguel for the summer. To allay her mother's distrust, it would be better for me not to call at the ranch, but this was easily compensated for when she suggested making several visits during the season with the Vox girls, chums of hers, who lived on the Frio about thirty miles due north of Las Palomas. This was fortunate, since the Vox ranch and ours were on the most friendly terms. We returned by the route by which we had left the grounds. I repicketed the horses, and we were soon mingling again with the revelers, having been absent little over an hour. No one seemed to have taken any notice of our absence. Mrs. Martin, I rejoiced to see, was still in the toe of her sister and Miss Jean, and from the circle of Las Palomas courtiers, who surrounded the ladies, I felt sure they had given her no opportunity even to miss her younger sister. Uncle Lance was the only member of our company absent, but I gave myself no uneasiness about him, since the mail contractors were both likewise missing. Rejoining our friends and assuming a nonchalant air, I flattered myself that my disguise was perfect. During the remainder of the afternoon, in view of the possibility that Esther might take her sister, Mrs. Martin, into our secret and win her as an ally, I cultivated that lady's acquaintance, dancing with her and leaving nothing undone to foster her friendship. Near the middle of the afternoon, as the three sisters, Miss Jean, and I were indulging in light refreshments at a booth some distance from the dancing arbor, I sighted my employer, Dan Happersett, and the two stage men returning from the store. They passed near, not observing us, and from the defiant tones of Uncle Lance's voice I knew that they had been tampering with the private stock of the merchant at Shepherd's. Why, gentlemen, said he, that ambulance team is no exception to the quality of mules I'm raising at Las Palomas. Drive up some time and spend a few days and take a look at the stock we're breeding, if you will, and if I don't show you mules fourteen and a half hands or better, I'll round up five hundred head and let you pick fifty as a pilon for your time and trouble. Why, gentlemen, Las Palomas has sold mules to the government. On the return of our party to the arbor, Happersat claimed to dance with Esther, thus freeing me. Uncle Lance was standing some little distance away, still entertaining the mail contractors, and I edged near enough to notice Oxenford's florid face and leery eye. But on my employer's catching sight of me, he excused himself to the stageman, and taking my arm, led me off. Together we promenaded out of sight of the crowd. "'How do you like my style of man-herder?' inquired the old matchmaker. "'Once we were out of hearing, why, Tom, I'd have held those male thieves until dark, if Dan hadn't drifted in and given me the wink.' Shepard kicked like a bay steer on letting me have a second quart bottle. But it took that to put the right glaze in the young Yank's eyes. "'Oh, I had him going south, all right. But tell me, how did you and Esther make it? We had reached a secluded spot, and seating ourselves on an old fallen tree trunk, I told of my success, even to the using of his horse. Never before or since did I see Uncle Lance give way to such a fit of hilarity as he indulged in over the perfect working out of our plans. With his hat he whipped me, the ground, the log on which we sat, while his peals of laughter rang out 
like the reports of a rifle. In his fit of ecstasy, tears of joy streaming from his eyes, he kept repeating again and again, Oh, sister, run quick and tell Pa to come. As we neared the grounds returning, he stopped me, and we had a further brief confidential talk together. I was young and egotistical enough to think that I could defy all the rivals in existence, but he cautioned me, saying, Hold on, Tom. You're young yet. You know nothing about the weaker sex. Absolutely nothing. It's not your fault, but due to your mere raw youth. Now listen to me, son. Don't underestimate any rival, particularly if he has gall and money, most of all money. Humanity is the same the world over. And while you may not have seen it here among the ranches, it is natural for a woman to rave over a man with money, even if he is only a pimply excuse for a creature. Still, I don't see that we have very much to fear. We can cut old Lady McLeod out of the matter entirely. But then there's the girl's sister, Mrs. Martin, and I look for her to cut up shameful when she smells the rat, which she is sure to do. And then there's her husband to figure on. If the ox knows his master's crib, it is only reasonable to suppose that Jack Martin knows where his bread and butter comes from. These stage men will stick up for each other like thieves. Now don't you be too crack sure but just a trifle leery of everyone, except, of course, the La Palomas outfit. I admit that I did not see clearly the reasoning behind much of this lecture, but I knew better than reject the advice of the old matchmaker, with his sixty-odd years of experience. I was still meditating over his remarks when we rejoined the crowd and were soon separated among the dancers. Several urged me to play the violin, but I was too busy looking after my own fences and declined the invitation. Casting about for the Vox girls, I found the eldest with whom I had a slight acquaintance, and being monopolized by Theodore Quayle and John Cotton, friendly rivals and favorites of the young lady. On my imploring the favor of a dance, she excused herself and joined me on a promenade about the grounds, missing one dance entirely. In arranging matters with her to send me word on the arrival of Esther at their ranch, I attempted to make her show some preference between my two comrades, under the pretense of knowing which one to bring along. But she only smiled and maintained an admirable neutrality. After a dance, I returned the elder Miss Vox to the tender care of John Cotton, and caught sight of my employer, leaving the arbor for the refreshment booth with a party of women, including Mrs. Martin and Esther McLeod, to whom he was paying the most devoted attention, witnessing the tireless energy of the old matchmaker, and in a quarter where he had little hope of an ally, brought me to thinking that there might be good cause for alarm in his warnings not to be overconfident. Miss Jean, whom I had not seen since luncheon, aroused me from my reverie and on her wishing to know my motive for cultivating the acquaintance of Miss Vox, neglecting my own sweetheart, I told her the simple truth. Good idea, Tom, she assented. I think I'll just ask Miss Frances home with me to spend Sunday. Then you can take her across to the Frio on horseback, so as not to offend either John or Theodore. What do you think? I thought it was a good idea and said so. At least... The taking of the young lady home would be a pleasanter task for me than breaking horses. But as I expressed myself so, I could not help thinking, seeing Miss Jean's zeal in the matter, that the matchmaking instinct was equally well developed on both sides of the loveless family. The afternoon was drawing to a close. The festivities would conclude by early sundown. Miss Jean would spend the night again at the halfway ranch, returning to Las Palomas the next morning. We would start on our return with the close of the amusements. Many who lived at a distance had already started home. It lacked but a few minutes of the closing hour when I sought out Esther for the home sweet home waltz, finding her in company of Oxenford, chaperoned by Mrs. Martin, of which 
there was need. My sweetheart excused herself with a poise that made my heart leap. And as we whirled away in the mazes of the final dance, rivals and all else passed into oblivion. Before we could realize the change in the music, the orchestra had stopped and struck into My Country Tis of Thee, in which the voice of every patriotic Texan present swelled the chorus until it echoed throughout the grove, befittingly closing San Jacinto Day. End of chapter 7Chapter Eight of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Cat Hunt on the Frio. The return of Miss Jean the next forenoon, accompanied by Francis Vaux, was an occasion of more than ordinary moment at Las Palomas. The Vaux family were of Creo extraction, but had settled on the Frio River nearly a generation before. Under the climatic change from the swamps of Louisiana to the mesas of Texas, the girls grew up fine physical specimens of rustic southern beauty. To a close observer, certain traces of the French were distinctly discernible in Miss Frances, notably in the large, lustrous eyes, the swarthy complexion, and early maturity of womanhood. Small wonder, then, that our guests should have played havoc among the young men of the countryside, adding to her train of gallants the devoted quail and cotton of Las Palomas. Aside from her charming personality, that Miss Vox should receive a cordial welcome at Las Palomas goes without saying, since there were many reasons why she should. The old ranchero and his sister chaperoned the young lady, while I, betrothed to another, became her most obedient slave. It is needless to add that there was a fair field and no favor showed by her host as between John and Theodore. The prize was worthy of any effort. The best man was welcome to win, while the blessings of master and mistress seemed impatient to descend upon the favorite one. In the work at hand I was forced to act as a rival to my friends for I could not afford to lower my reputation for horsemanship before Miss Frances, when my betrothed was shortly to be her guest. So it was not to be wondered at that Quail and Cotton should abandon the Mendeno in mounting their unbroken geldings, and I had to follow suit or suffer by comparison. The other rascals, equal if not superior, to our trio in horsemanship, including Enrique, born with just sense enough to be a fearless vaquero, and took to the heavy sand and mounting vicious geldings. But we three jauntily gave the wildest horses their heads, and even encouraged them to buck whenever our guest was sighted on the gallery. What gave special vim to our work was the fact that Miss Frances was a horsewoman herself, and it was with difficulty that she could be kept away from the corrals. Several times a day our guest prevailed upon Uncle Lance to take her out to witness the roping. From a safe vantage place on the palisades, the old ranchero and his protégé would watch us catching, saddling, and mounting the geldons. Under those bright eyes, lariats encircled the feet of the horse to be ridden, deftly indeed, and he was laid on his side in the sand as daintily as a mother would lay her babe in its crib. Outside of the trio, the work of the gang was bunglesome, calling for many protests from Uncle Lance. They had no ladies' glances to spur them on, while ours merited the enthusiastic plaudits of Miss Frances. Then came Sunday, and we observed the commandment. Miss Jean had planned a picnic for the day on the river. We excused Trebusio and pressed the ambulance team into service to convey the party of six for the day's outing among the fine groves of elm that bordered the river in several places, and afforded ample shade from the sun. The day was delightfully spent. The chaperones were negligent and dilatory. Uncle Lance even fell asleep for several hours. 
but when we returned at twilight the ambulance mules were garlanded as if for a wedding party the next morning our guest was to depart and to me fell the pleasant task of acting as her escort uncle lance prevailed on miss francis to ride a spirited chestnut horse from his mount while i rode a grilla from my own we made an early start the old ranchero riding with us as far as the river as he held the hand of miss vox in parting he cautioned her not to detain me at their ranch as he had used for me at las palomas of course said he i don't mean that you shall hurry him right off to-day or even to-morrow but these lazy rascals of mine will hang around a girl a week if she allowed it had john or theodore taken you home i shouldn't expect to see either of them in a fortnight now if they don't treat you right at home come back and live with us i'll adopt you as my daughter and tell your pa that the first general rain that falls on coming over with my hounds for a cat hunt with him good-bye sweetheart it was a delightful ride across to the frio mounted on two splendid horses we put the nueces behind us as the hours passed frequently we met large strings of cattle drifting in towards the river for their daily drink and miss frances insisted on riding through the cows noticing every brand as keenly as a vaquero on the lookout for strays from her father's ranch the young calves scampered out of our way, but their sedate mothers permitted us to ride near enough to read the brands as we met and passed. Once we rode a mile out of our way to look at a manada. The stallion met us as we approached, as if to challenge all intruders on his domain. But we met him defiantly, and he turned aside and permitted us to examine his harem and its frolicsome colts. When cattle and horses no longer served as a subject, and the wide expanse of flowery mesas studded here and there with Spanish daggers, whose creamy flowers nodded to us as we passed, ceased to interest us, we turned to the ever-interesting subject of sweethearts. But try as I might, I could never wring any confession from her which even suggested a preference among her string of admirers. On the other hand, when she twitted me about Esther, I proudly pleaded guilty of a platonic friendship which some day I hoped would ripen into something more permanent, fully realizing that the very first time these two chums met there would be an interchange of confidences, and in the full knowledge that during these whispered admissions the truth would be revealed, I stoutly denied that Esther and I were even betrothed. But during the morning's ride I made a friend and an ally of Francis Vox. There was some talk of a tournament to be held during the summer at Campbellton on the Atascosa. She promised that she would detain Esther for it and find a way to send me word, and we would make up a party and attend it together. I had never been present at any of these pastoral tourneys, and was hopeful that one would be held within reach of our ranch for I had heard a great deal about them, and was anxious to see one. But this was only one of several social outings which she outlined as on her summer program, to all of which I was cordially invited as a member of her party. There was to be a dance on St. John's Day at the Mission, a barbecue in June on the San Miguel, and other local meets for the summer and early fall. By the time we reached the ranch, I was just beginning to realize that socially Shepherd's Ferry and the Nueces was a poky place. The next morning I returned to Las Palomas. The horse-breaking was nearing an end. During the month of May we went into camp on a new tract of land which had been recently acquired to build a tank on a dry arroyo, which crossed this last landed addition to the ranch. It was a commercial peculiarity of Uncle Lance to acquire land, but to never part with it under any consideration. To a certain extent, cows and land had become his religion, and whenever either adjoining Las Palomas was for sale, they were looked upon as a safe bank of deposit for any surplus funds. The last tract thus secured was dry. But by damming the arroyo, we could store water in this tank or reservoir 
to tide over the dry spells. All the Mexican help on the ranch was put to work with wheelbarrows, while six mule teams plowed, scraped, and hauled rock, one four-mule team being constantly employed in hauling water over ten miles for camp and stock purposes. This dry stream ran water when conditions were favorable, several months in the year, and by building the tank our cattle capacity would be largely increased. One evening, late in the month, when the water wagon returned, Trabucio brought a request from Miss Jean, asking me to come into the ranch that night. Responding to the summons, I was rewarded by finding a letter awaiting me from Francis Vox, left by a vaquero, passing from the Frio to Santa Maria. It was a dainty missive, informing me that Esther was her guest, that the tournament would not take place, but to be sure, and come over on Sunday. Personally, the note was satisfactory, but that I was to bring anyone along was artfully omitted. Being thus forced to read between the lines on my return to camp the next morning by dawn, without a word of explanation, I submitted the matter to John and Theodore. Uncle Lance, of course, had known what had called me into the ranch, and taking the letter from Quayle, read it himself. That's plain enough, said he, on the first reading. John will go with you Sunday, and if it rains next month, I'll take Theodore with me when I go over for a cat hunt with old man Pierre. I'll let him act as master of the horse, no, of the hounds, and give him a chance to toot his own horn with Francis. Honest, boys, I'm getting disgusted with the white element of Las Palomas. We raise most everything here but white babies. Even Enrique, the rascal, has to live in camp now to hold down his breakfast. But you young whites, with the country just full of young women, well, it's certainly discouraging. I do all I can, and Sis helps a little. But what does it amount to? What are the results? The poem that Jean reads to us occasionally must be right. I reckon the Caucasian is played out. Before the sun was an hour high, John Cotton and myself rode into the Vox Ranch on Sunday morning. The girls gave us a cheerful welcome. While we were breakfasting, several other lads and lasses rode up, and we were informed that a little picnic for the day had been arranged. As this was to our liking, John and I readily acquiesced, and shortly afterwards a mounted party of about a dozen young folk set out for a hackberry grove up the river several miles. Lunch baskets were taken along, but no chaperones. The girls were all dressed in cambric and muslin, and as light in heart as the fabric and ribbons they flaunted. I was gratified with the boldness of Cotton, as he cantered away with Francis, and with a day before him there is every reason to believe that his cause would be advanced, as to myself, with Esther by my side, the live-long day, I could not have asked the world to widen an inch. It was midnight when we reached Las Palomas returning. As we rode along that night, John confessed to me that Frances was a tantalizing enigma. Up to a certain point she offered every encouragement, but beyond that there seemed to be a dead line over which she allowed no sentiment to pass. It was plain to be seen that he was discouraged, but I told him I had gone through worse ordeals. Throughout southern Texas and the country tributary to the Nueces River, we always looked for heaviest rainfall during the month of June. This year in particular, we were anxious to see a regular downpour to start the Arroyo and test our new tank. Besides, we had sold for delivery in July 1,200 beef steers for shipment at Rockport on the coast. If only a soaking rain would fall, making water plentiful, we could make the drive in little over a hundred miles, while the dry season would compel us to follow the river nearly double the distance. We were riding our range thoroughly, locating our fattest beeves when one evening, as June DeWeese and I were on the way back from the Gonzo, a regular equinoctial struck us, accompanied by a downpour of rain and hail. Our horses turned their backs to the storm, 
but we drew slickers over our heads and defied the elements instead of letting up as darkness set in the storm seemed to increase in fury and we were forced to seek shelter we were at least fifteen miles from the ranch and it was simply impossible to force a horse against that sheeting rain so turning to catch the storm in our backs we rode for a ranchita belonging to las palomas by the aid of flashes of lightning and the course of the storm we reached the little ranch and found a haven a steady rain fell all night continuing the next day but we saddled early and rode for our new reservoir on the arroyo imagine our surprise on sighting the embankment to see two horsemen ride up from the opposite direction and halt at the dam giving rein to our horses and galloping up we found they were uncle lance and theodore quayle above the dam the arroyo was running like a mill tail the water in the reservoir covered several acres and had backed up stream nearly a quarter of a mile the deepest point in the tank reaching my saddle skirts the embankment had settled solidly holding the gathering water to our satisfaction and after several hours inspection we rode for home with this splendid rain las palomas ranch took on an air of activity the old ranchero paced the gallery for hours in great glee watching the downpour it was too soon yet by a week to gather the beeves but under the glowing prospect we could not remain inert the next morning the segundo took all the teams and returned to the tank to watch the dam and haul rock to riprap the flanks of the embankment taking extra saddle horses with us uncle lance dan happersat quail and myself took the hounds and struck across for the frio on reaching the vox ranch as showers were still falling and the underbrush reeking with moisture wetting any one to the skin who dared to invade it we did not hunt that afternoon pierre vox was enthusiastic over the rain while his daughters were equally so over the prospects of riding to the hounds there being now nearly forty dogs in the double pack at the first opportunity, Francis confided to me that Mrs. McLeod had forbidden Esther visiting them again, since some busybody had carried the news of our picnic to her ears. But she promised me that if I could direct the hunt on the morrow within a few miles of the McLeod ranch, she would entice my sweetheart out and give me a chance to meet her. There was a roguish look in Miss Francis's eyes during this disclosure which I was unable to fathom. But I promised during the few days' hunt to find some means to direct the chase within striking distance of the ranch on the San Miguel. I promptly gave this bit of news and confidence to Uncle Lance, and was told to lie low and leave matters to him. That evening, amid clouds of tobacco smoke, the two old rancheros discussed the best hunting in the country while we youngsters danced on the gallery to the strains of a fiddle. I heard Mr. Vox narrating a fight with a cougar which killed two of his best dogs during the winter just past, and before we retired it was understood that we would give the haunts of the same old cougar our first attention. End of chapter 8